of sits down that we can begin. <laughs> Nick doesn't even, you know, does nothing for you. Publicly. Okay, welcome back to the last afternoon, last half day of After Extinction. Uh, finally, at the end of the day, Extinction will be over. So I think, you know, a round of applause for that. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome my friend and colleague, Tasha Oren, who will introduce uh, Carrie Wolf for the final plenary. And just to remind you, after this, we will have a um, last breakout session and then uh, a kind of casual informal round table afterward just to see what kind of coherencies we've uh, seen, what kind of answers we've arrived at, or what kind of questions, um, new questions we've discovered. And we'll just take that as long as we've got momentum to do that and schedule to end about 5.15, but we'll just see how it goes. So it's a beautiful day out. There's no reason to be forced to stay inside. Anyway, with that, talk. Good afternoon. Um, we've been just sitting outside and talking about how depressed we're all been and in a good way. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know, I mean, talk of extinction, pollution, and genocide would, would do that to you. So I've been, I've been challenged to tell a joke, and, and I, I've got one. I'm going to start us off with a joke, and it's actually it's Patrick Curry's joke. I don't know if you know Patrick Curry's work, he's an eco uh, writer and philosopher. And, but the, the thing is, for me, every joke is a, is a Jewish joke, so I'm going to tell it <laughs> as a Jewish joke. So, you know, most Jewish jokes start with a Chaim and a Moshe who meet <laughs> at a town square. So Chaim uh, is walking and sees Moshe, and Moshe looks terrible. He's distraught, he's pacing, he looks anxious. And Chaim says, Moshe, what is the matter? And Moshe says, oh, oh, Chaim, I'm, I'm so distraught. I haven't slept in two days. I have two reasons. I have two reasons to be completely besides myself. And Chaim says, relax, relax. Moshe, why don't you tell me the first reason? And Moshe says, the first reason? You want to hear the first reason? I'll tell you the first reason. Global warming is destroying our planets. Um, the rainforest is being turned into a parking lot. 10,000 species are being destroyed and go extinct every day. We're doomed, Chaim. We're doomed. And Chaim says, Moish, Moish, relax. The human race will overcome. We've weathered storms. We will survive. And Moish says, I know. That's my second reason. <laughs> and I, I start to, I, I sort of tell this joke, not only because, you know, extinction, anxiety, humor is, you know. Um, but also because um, it struck me that this kind of story of an encounter is an encounter, right, between humanism and post-humanism, in a certain sense. And this is the kind of encounter and the kind, um, you know, of reorientation that Carrie Wolf's work has been about, uh, in, not only in his own writing, but also as the founding and series editor of the uh, Post-Humanity series at the University of Minnesota Press. Um, so I hope it's not entirely kind of out, out of touch with, the, with what's going on. But um, in several of his books, essays and collections, and uh, I should mention some, I'll mention a few of them, um, Animal Rights, American Culture, The Discourse of Species, and Post-Humanist Theory in 2003. The two edited collections, Zoontologies, The Question of the Animal from uh, 2003, and The Other, Emerson in 2010, and most recently, What is Post-Humanism? Uh, in 2010, and my own personal favorite, Before the Law, which is from 2012, Humans and Other Animals in a Biopolitical Frame. And in these and these works, Carrie has uh, has been Carrie Wolf has been developing a dazzlingly expansive and elegantly argued explication of what a posthumanist approach looks like and its intellectual, ethical, and political stakes. Wolf's posthumanism neither rejects humanism nor embraces the notion of the posthuman as a fantasies of techno disembodiment or transcendence. For Wolf, it's the it's the question of the animal 
the non-human form of life that is at the core of any conception of ethics and politics and thus culture and our experience of self in the world. His most sustained and deeply influential critique has been his engagement with the rights-based claims that frame traditional arguments about human treatment of animals and animal rights discourse. As Wolf has shown, the humanist construction of subjectivity, predicated as it is on agency um, and uh, autonomy, and a rights discourse drawn from liberal justice traditions, rest on structures of membership and thus exclusion. A principle of humanism that, as he writes, is species specific in its logic, but not in its effects, as a history of oppression, slavery, and mass murder surely attests. Instead of the liberal humanist model of animal rights, which he argues regards animals as merely uh, kind of diminished humans, um, Wolf constructs a situated ethic based precisely on difference, an ethic of affinity without reciprocity. In What is Posthumanism, Wolf offered extended engagements not only with theory and philosophy, but with poetry, art, music, film, landscape design, demonstrating how varied cultural sites are open to posthumanist insights and transformative potential. In his most recent book, Before the Law, he turns to an encounter between animal studies and biopolitics and, uh, and the far-reaching implications for notions of justice and sovereignty once the question of animal, animal ethics is worked through a biopolitical frame. Kerry Wolf is most identified as the founding figure of animal studies, but his work has been deeply important and influential across disciplines, from philosophy to cultural, literary, and certainly um, disability studies. Whatever our or disciplinary origins, a working ethic, as Wolf reminds us, is neither simple nor fixed, but is ongoing work, work that pushes us to conceive of an expanded community of the living an ethic that accounts for both non-human and human animals. Please help me welcome Carrie Wilde. Let me go backwards here, I hope. Uh, OK, the first thing I want to do is get everybody to join me in thanking Richard and Emily for this fantastic conference. <laughs> I've been to a lot of conferences this year, believe me, and this, is, this has really been a good one. Um, and that was a good joke. Uh, actually, I want to I, I tell a joke. My, this is my favorite joke to tell my good friend and colleague, Tim Morton. Uh, what did the uh, Zen Buddhist say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. Make me one with everything. <laughs> <laughs> I tell Tim that joke about twice a week, probably. <laughs> All right, uh, so let me get the, uh, hold on, let me get the lights down here. There we go. There we go, you'll be able to see the slides. Um, so I want to, without further ado, because it's a little bit of a long talk, that's the bad news. The good news is I got a bunch of slides, and I'm talking about two art installations. So <coughs> I hope that makes up for the, uh, the length of my remarks. Uh, I want to start with an assertion that's going to seem paradoxical to some people and commonsensical to others. Extinction is both the most natural thing in the world and at the same time is never and never could be natural. On the one hand, 99% of all species that have ever existed in the history of the planet are extinct. On the other hand, extinction can hardly be regarded as natural in any simple sense, not just because, as a number of people have argued, nature, conceived as some realm apart, untouched and unshaped by human affairs ceased to exist a long time ago, as all the talk about climate change in the Anthropocene makes clear. Beyond this, the psychoanalytically inclined among us point out that any human registration of the so-called fact of nature is always already radically denaturalized because the symbolic and imaginary realms that register the presence of nature in their different ways for us are anything but natural. As Slavoj Žižek put it now 25 years ago, and that sounds weird to say, actually. As, as Žižek said 25 years ago, uh, when I was still reading Žižek, the, the fact that man, this is a quote from, from Slavoj, the fact that man is the speaking being means precisely that he is, so to speak, constitutively derailed, 
an open wound of the world, as Hegel put it, that excludes man forever from the circular movement of life, so that all attempts to regain a new balance between man and nature can only be a form of fetishistic disavowal. Now, one way, <coughs> one way to double down, as my friend Jeffrey Nealon would put it on this assertion, is to realize that everything Zizek says does not only apply to human beings, because we aren't the only speaking beings, as we now know, even as we cannot say in any neat and simplistic way which non-human forms of life fall under the purview of this assertion and which do not, a desire for conceptual purification that would be its own form of fetishistic disavowal, as Derrida, among others, has pointed out. And a way to double down even more on that point is to take seriously Derrida's counterintuitive and indeed seemingly outlandish insistence that, quote, each time something dies, it's the end of the world. Not the end of a world, but of the world, of the whole world, of the infinite opening of the world. And this is the case for no matter what living being, from the tree to the protozoa, from the mosquito to the human, death is infinite. It is the end of the infinite the finitude of the infinite, unquote. <coughs> now, as we'll see in a moment, this seemingly brazen assertion uh, can be redescribed in more naturalistic terms that make it seem a lot less counterintuitive and help to draw out the fact that what is going on here is not just an excessively Heideggerian hangover on Derrida's part. Rather, he's trying to move us from what he calls the dogma of Heidegger's famous or infamous investigations of the differences between humans and animals and rocks to the inescapable necessity of paying attention to the different ways of being in the world. And it's on those differences that the hard and detailed questions, political questions and ethical questions of thinking about extinction depend. <coughs> so that's my, that's my brief preamble. It's difficult to generalize then about extinction and it's even difficult to generalize about it when we limit ourselves to the class of creatures called birds as we'll see now in two recent art installations I want to discuss, one on the California condor and one on the passenger pigeon. The first exhibition opening in the fall of 2014 at the Arizona State University Art Museum is a project by Mark Wilson and Brenda Snabjorn's daughter called Trout Fishing in America and Other Stories, which centers on current conservation efforts in and around the Grand Canyon area of the Colorado River the focus mainly on two species, a not so well-known fish called the humpback chub <coughs> and, a California, and the California condor, which is a very famous bird indeed, having the largest wingspan, nearly 10 feet of any bird in the world, rivaled only by the trumpeter swan in size and weight, and often living to 60 years old or more. California condors actually became extinct in the wild in 1987, when the remaining 22 individuals were captured and an ambitious conservation program was launched. In 1991, they were reintroduced into the wild and as of October 19, excuse me, October 2014, the total world population stands at 425 birds, either in the wild or in captivity, making it one of the world's rarest birds. Wilson and Snabjorn's daughter, daughter's ex, ex, exhibition consists of several different, different elements but the one I'm going to focus on today for lack of time is a series of photographs of the bodies of 14 dead California condors, each with a transcribed text about the bird taken from a conversation with one of the biologists working in the conservation program. <coughs> These birds were retrieved from a freezer at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and most of them died from lead poisoning, feeding on animals killed by hunters killed with lead bullets. <coughs> When I, when I went to give a talk in conjunction with the opening of the show, which incidentally Ron Brolio, who's participating in the conference, really is the person who made that show happen. So we have him to thank for uh, the show and these slides and in a way this talk. I was immersed in Derrida's second set of seminars when I gave this talk at the show, uh, the second set of seminars on the beast and the sovereign. And to me, these images called forth a line that ends Paul Celan's poem, Vast Glowing Vault, which Derrida returns to again and again in the seminars. The line is, the world is gone, I must carry you. Ceylon's poem begins, vast glowing vault with a swarm of black stars pushing themselves out and away. Onto a ram's solicified forehead, I brand this image between the horns. Now many things could be said about the relation between these lines and the condor images 
But in the limited space I have here, I want to pursue an invitation suggested by the vault of the poem's title and how it might be linked to the vault from which the condor bodies themselves have emerged, a vault that pushes inward, not outward, as it were, to be placed before, before us in what strikes me, at least in some of these images, as a funereal setting or a scene of exhumation, an invitation to raise a question central to Derrida's seminars and central to my response to these images, namely, what do we call these bodies before us? Are they corpses, remains, or just objects like a rock, a table, or a leaf? And if not, if they are remains, what are they remains of? To whom or to what do they belong? And what, in turn, is owed to them? To address these questions is to unavoidably ask, as Derrida does, quote, what a, be what a beast and men have in common, unquote. And central to Heidegger's dogmatic response, as Derrida puts it, is his well-known assertion, Heidegger's well-known assertion, that animals perish, but only human beings die, because human beings, unlike animals, have an understanding of death as such. They grasp their own mortality and live in the light of it in a way that, el that eludes the animal, who at the end of its life simply ceases to exist biologically. <coughs> and yet, as Derrida wonders in many places, do human beings really have this kind of relationship to death as such? One that would allow this apparently radical form of finitude to be reappropriated as a being able, a power, or a potency. Isn't it the case, rather, that we can never know the as such of death because death is always elsewhere and at a distance for us, even though it is, paradoxically, the thing that most testifies to our concrete and unique existence, our singularity? After all, you can't experience your own death. You can only experience death in and through the death of the other. And all attempts to imagine or think about death <coughs> are always, and this came up in, in Joseph Masco's talk, all attempts to imagine or think about death are always, as Derrida points out, phantasmatic. And this, and, and this suffices all the less, he continues, and I'm quoting now, to distinguish clearly between death as such and life as such, because all our thoughts of death are always structurally thoughts of survival. To see oneself or to think oneself dead is to see oneself surviving, present at one's own death, unquote. What Derrida, <coughs> what Derrida is emphasizing here is not the finitude referenced by Heidegger, the confrontation with my mortality and his famous existential of being toward death, but rather what we might call the finitude of my finitude, the, its non-appropriability for and by me, its radical alterity, one that sets up a, a relationship of asymmetrical, unpredictable, and finally unappeasable alterity to the other. Thus, he writes, death means above all, quote, to be exposed or delivered over with no possible defense, once totally disarmed to the other, unquote. And so the other names, quote, what, al what always might one day do something with me and my remains, make me into a thing, and do so, moreover, as they wish, unquote. To put it this way <coughs> is to realize that this relationship of alterity and incalculability to the other is, without let up and without assurances, indeed because without assurances, a scene of ethical responsibility. And that is precisely the situation in into which we are thrust, I would suggest, by these images. What shall we do with these remains that are delivered over to us? What will we make of them? And what will that make of us? <coughs> Here, I think, it's helpful to augment Derrida's insistence on the alterity of other forms of life by redescribing it in terms of biological systems theory. But before we do, we need to follow the penultimate turn in Derrida's argument to come back now to the last line of Ceylon's poem, which is made up of a movement through three possible theses finished off with a meditation on the last. And so this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is kind of a long, a long quotation where Derrida is trying out three theses about this relationship of humans and animals and, and the question of the world. Thesis one, incontestably, animals and humans inhabit the same world, the same objective world, even if they do not have the same experience of the objectivity of the object. Thesis two, incontestably, animals and humans do not inhabit the same world, for the human world will never be purely and simply identical to the world of animals. Thesis three, and this is the long one, in spite of this identity and this difference, 
neither animals of different species, nor humans of different cultures, nor any animal or human individual inhabit the same world as another. And the difference between one world and another will always remain unbridgeable because the community of the world is always constructed, simulated by a set of stabilizing apparatuses, nowhere and never given in nature. Between my world and any other world, there is first the space and time of an infinite difference, an interruption that is incommensurable with all attempts to make a passage, a bridge, an isthmus, all attempts at communication, translation, trope, and transfer that the desire for a world will try, to pro, will try to pose, impose, propose, and stabilize. There is no world, there are only islands." Unquote. <coughs> now it's the first thesis, as you all probably know, that is usually taken to be the ecological one. But my point here is that by the logic we're tracing, it's actually the third thesis, that there is no world, that is the most radically ecological, or even better, we might say, environmental. Derrida's assertion <coughs> might seem counterintuitive, but it will seem less so if we remember that in terms of biological systems theory, there is no world, quote unquote, precisely for the reasons we may trace back to the work of Jakob von Uxkel's work on human and, human and animal umwelt and, and forward to those who work on the biology of consciousness and cognition, such as Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela, who demonstrate that what counts as world is always a product of the contingent and selective practices deployed in the embodied inaction of a particular autopoetic living system. As philosopher of mind Alvin Noe argues, quote, the locus of consciousness is the dynamic life of the whole environmentally plugged in person or animal, unquote. And as his work shows, recent research in the biology of consciousness makes it clear that these questions do not neatly break along the lines of humans, human versus animal, inside versus outside, brain versus world, or even for that matter, organic versus inorganic. As Noah puts it, quote, <coughs> it's not the case that all animals have a common external environment because to each different form of animal life there is a distinct corresponding ecological domain or habitat, which means in short that all animals live in structured worlds, unquote. Now I think we're in a better position to follow Derrida as he moves rapidly in the next moment of the seminar from an equally bracing phrase taken from Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, the phrase, I am alone, to Ceylon's memorable line, which we have already quoted, the world is gone, I must carry you. As Derrida puts it in a later session that year, <coughs> picking up the thread, quote, we could move for a long time between fort and da, da and fort, between these two theirs, between Heidegger and Ceylon, between on the one hand the Da of Dasein, and on the other hand Ceylon's fort and Die Welt its fort. The world has gone in the absence or distance of the world. I must, I owe it to you, I owe it to myself to carry you without world, without the foundation or grounding of anything in the world, without any foundational or fundamental mediation, one on one, like wearing mourning or bearing a child, Basically, this is where ethics begins, unquote. <coughs> now, though I can't pursue the point in detail here, it's worth noting that this scene of responsibility generated by the absence of world, not lack, but absence, and that's an important difference, is also a scene of what is sometimes called spectra spectrality or hauntology, a scene of responsibility to those already gone, wearing mourning, or those not yet here, bearing a child. Now it's possible, I think, <coughs> to give a scientific account of how this hauntology or spectrality obtains in our relation to the living and to questions of extinction, an account, of how, an account that we're invited to pursue by remembering that paying attention to the non-generic character of the system environment relationship for particular creatures is in fact quite consonant with Derrida's insistence on what he calls complicating, thickening, delinearizing, folding, and dividing the line between different life forms. A move away from simplicity, namely the simplicity of the ham-fisted distinction human versus animal, and toward complexity, namely the non-generic complexity of the system environment relation as that evolves both ontogenetically and phylogenetically, and a complexity, it, a complexity that is, in principle, to use Derrida's term, infinite. Indeed, <coughs> as theoretical biologist and MacArthur fellow student Stuart Kaufman argues, 
The world is enchanted, which is his word, not mine, precisely because there are no entailing laws, as he puts it, that govern in Newtonian fashion the evolution of the biosphere and its various forms of life. As Kaufman puts it, even before we reach the level of what he calls Kantian holes, such as California condors and passenger pigeons, we have to ask, and this is a long quote from Kaufman, <coughs> we have to ask, has the universe in 13.7 billion years of existence created all the possible fundamental particles and stable atoms? Yes. Now consider proteins. These are linear sequences of 20 kinds of amino acids that typically fold into some shape and catalyze a reaction or perform some structural or other function. A biological protein can range from perhaps 50 amino acids long to several thousands. A typical length is 300 amino acids long. Then let's consider all possible proteins of length 200 amino acids. How many are possible? Each position in the 200 has 20 possible choices of amino acids, so there are 20 times 20 times 20 200 times, or 20 to the 200th power, which is roughly 10 to the 260th power, possible proteins of length 200. Now let's ask if the universe can have created all these proteins since its inception 13.7 billion years ago. They're roughly 10 to the 80th particles in the known universe. If they were doing nothing, ignoring space-like se space separation, but making proteins on the shortest time scale in the universe, the Planck time scale of 10 raised to the negative 43 seconds, it would take 10 raised to the 39th power times the lifetime of our universe to make all possible proteins of length 200 just once. <coughs> in short, he continues, in the lifetime of our universe, only a vastly tiny fraction of all possible proteins can have been created. This means profound things. First, the universe is vastly non-ergotic. It is not like a gas at equilibrium in statistical mechanics. With this vast non-ergosity, when the possibilities are vastly larger than what can actually happen, history enters." Unquote. <coughs> of course, of course, Kaufman argues, this principle obtains even more radically at the level of Kantian holes, such as condors and passenger pigeons. And from this vantage, what we confront in the bodies of these dead condors is precisely a materialized trace whose inscrutability haunts the present with retentions from an evolutionary past and protensions of an evolutionary future whose radical alterity resides in the fact that they are constituted by a complexity of recursive system environment relations that are, in principle, as Kaufman argues, non-transparent to those who would control, direct, or predict them, try as they might. Nevertheless, <coughs> if I, as I've explored in some detail elsewhere, namely before the law, in the face of this complexity infinit and infinitude, we're forced to make decisions all the time without foundational or fundamental mediation, as Derrida puts it, about the letting die and the killing of various forms of life, both human and non-human. And this leads to the final and far from trivial point about the animals foregrounded by this installation, that these bodies before us are in fact part of an archive, one enmeshed in a complex landscape of legal, political, and scientific forms of power knowledge, what Derrida calls those stabilizing apparatuses that simulate the sure and steady existence of a world in the face of the complexities that we've just outlined. For as he points out, <coughs> quote, there are no archives without political power. And the archive is thus a kind, a kind of mise-en-scene of, quote, two principles in one. The principle, according to nature or history, there where things commence, physical, historical, or ontological principle, but also the principle according to the law, there where men and gods command there where authority, social order, are exercised in this place from which order is given." Unquote. <coughs> As it is with the archive, so it is, I think, with extinction. On the one hand, there's nothing more natural, as we've already said. It's an event that happens there in nature. But at the same time, extinction is and can never be a natural event because it always takes place within a horizon of our world and its organizing and governing principles. 
But that stabilization through stabilizing apparatuses is always marked by something else that's preserved, maybe even mainly preserved in the archive, what Derrida calls the a destination or destinerance that attends any attempt to make good on our ethical and political commitments <coughs> to materialize our world, to address the other to whom we feel responsible, an a destination that stems from the fact that the same sign or trace or mark can function in opposite, in, in opposite ways in very different contexts. The constraints of scientific method and protocol, of course, constitute a canonical attempt to control, even eliminate, this destinerance, but its most compelling manifestation in this installation is, I think, the lead bullet that leaves its trace, sometimes in the discoloration of the animal's body <coughs> through lead poisoning, but sometimes invisible. In these bodies, but not of them, you might say, in the materialization of two theirs in one place. That destinerance quite literally attends such tidy ethical, legal, and political distinctions as we like to make between the polar opposites of game animals or trash animals who are deemed killable but not murderable, the animals that sustain these carrion feeders called condors, and those who, like the condor, <coughs> are rare or threatened and protected with the fullest backing of scientific and political apparatuses. The archive may record the official story of body weight, reproductive rate, legal status, and so on, <coughs> excuse me, but it also actualizes something more. And in that other space, that other scene, we discover that the world is not given, but made. We thus discover, in short, a scene of responsibility. <coughs> excuse me, now I want to move on now to talk about Michael Pestel's uh, remarkable installation, Requiem Ectopistus Migratorius, which was also mounted in the fall of 2014. And this is Michael doing an improvisational piece uh, in an aviary where he takes various instrument in, instruments in and has extended uh, conversations in a way with, <coughs> with different kinds of birds. Anyway, Ectopistus Migratorius uh, centers not just on a different species of bird, the passenger pigeon, the centennial of whose extinction the installation memorializes, but also the specter of a single bird, Martha, the last of her kind, who died in a display in the Cincinnati Zoo on September 1st, 1914. Now, in a longer discussion, there would be much to say about this curious fact, namely dating the extinction of an entire species to a particular day. But I'll begin by noting that the centrality of Martha marks the extinction event of this particular species and Pestel's installation as something qualitatively quite different from the California condors of the Wilson and Snabion's daughter exhibition. At the center of Pestel's extremely complex installation <coughs> is a large round wooden structure called Martha's Peel. The term peel here referring not to a covering or its removal, but to the small square defensive towers of the sort that were built in the 16th century in the border counties of England and Scotland, mimicked here by the 12 foot high by 8 foot diameter wooden structure resembling a large bird cage with a rotating stool at its center and a video camera mounted on top to record the activities of those who enter the structure. Martha's Peel is paired with two other components that stand across from it. Passenger is a wooden, <coughs> excuse me, a wooden trestle, train trestle of about 20 feet long supporting a modified O-scale train car that moves back and forth across its length casting a shadow both inside and outside the trestle, and viewers, and viewers are invited to sight down the length of the trestle of the, tra of the train as it moves. There we go. Peel's foe consists of a long palindrome that sits above the train trestle, uh, inscribed on slate panels, uh, reading, Peel's foe, not a set animal, laminates a tone of sleep. That's what's written on the panels above the train trestle on, on the slate. Uh, Michael's long been into um, palindromes and anagrams. These elements reference two of the three main factors that contributed to the passenger pigeon's extinction, the rifle and the railroad, which are alluded to not just by the, the O-scale train, but also by the viewer sighting down the interior of the train trestle as down the barrel of a gun. And I was actually reminded of Antoine Tresnel's discussion earlier of, uh, of uh, 
uh, Marais and his actually his 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 gun that's also a camera taking pictures of of wildlife. Uh, the role of the rifle will be clear enough in a moment, but the railroad played a major factor in transporting large hordes of hunters to the migratory roosting sites, and crucially with the invention of refrigerated cars, which allowed the transportation of fresh squab meat, as it was called, to urban centers. The third main factor in the passenger pigeon's demise, <coughs> the invention of the telegraph, allowed masses of hunters to be alerted to, as to roosting locations. And the telegraph, and specifically its iterability, is linked in the exhibition to writing, pecking, and musical notation, and of course the iterability of birdsong itself, in numerous ways, including uh, flugel, the catalog of extinct birds, a cluster of elements including a grand piano, uh, a musical composition that algorithmically translates the Latin names of almost 200 species of extinct birds into corresponding musical phrases, and a large collection of piano cluster boards, which you can see in the lower left-hand left -hand corner, or PCBs, which uses uh, spaced wood dowels that, when placed down on the keys, automatically plays a corresponding musical phrase. <coughs> Another element called erasure, uh, which consists of a video of the names of extinct birds being written on a chalkboard and then erased, which is shown on a small video screen mounted above Martha's Peel, that can only be viewed through bird watching binoculars. There it is, way up in the corner. And three piano harps, uh, which one of which incorporates a 1914 Oliver typewriter <coughs> as part of the instrumentation that viewers play to generate a sound field for a looping video of a dancing bird called Pigeon 98. And clearly, the shape of the piano harps and also of the uh, of the typewriter mechanism recall the wings of a bird. Uh, in the rows of letters mounted on the glass wall at the entrance of the exhibition, which I'll come back to in more detail later. And finally, in the performances of Pestle himself at various times during the exhibition, which include impro improvisations on a large handmade wooden recorder called the Bird Machine that incorporates a row of various bird calls mounted out to the side. So he goes back and forth between playing the Bird Machine and making calls on the bird calls, <coughs> and on a flute that he plays in the performance that fires wadding of the sort used in musket-loading rifles into a gong mounted on one of the piano harps to punctuate the performance. So you can see there's a hell of a lot going on in this show. <laughs> but if you can keep up with some of it, that's great. We find in this exhibition, then, an extremely complex conjugation of the relationship between time, space, and how those are related to questions of code, iterability, technology, notation, the disposition and articulation of the body, and performance and performativity, all of which in turn is framed by the relationship of singularity and multiplicity that figures here quite differently from what we find with the California Condor and the exhibition dedicated to it. Indeed, what structures the entire story of the extinction of the passenger pigeon is the poignant contrast between the singularity of Martha, the palsied 29-year-old sterile sole survivor of her species, and what the species itself was in fact most known for, flocks that, according to the estimate of none other than John James Audubon, could number over a billion birds and were said to darken the skies for days at a time. <coughs> As Anita Albus, recounts Audubon's experience in her beautiful book on rare birds, and I'm quoting her now, not one pigeon would land unless some of their millions of fiery red eyes could spy some woods <coughs> with beech mast or acorns uh, or fields of wheat or rice for their millions of pitch black bills. If a falcon tried to seize a bird in the flock, the pigeons quickly closed ranks into a compact mass, generating a roll of thunder with their beating wings. Like a living torrent, they plunged down in almost solid masses, and as Audubon writes, darted, darted forward in undulating and, and angular lines, descended and swept close over the earth with inconceivable velocity, mounted perpendicularly so as to resemble a vast column, and when high, were seen wheeling and twisting with their continued lines, which then resembled the coils of a gigantic serpent." Unquote. She continues, Moved by the beauty of the spectacle, this painter of birds observed how one flock after the other 
would fly into the space where a pigeon had just escaped a, fal a falcon's talon, and how, even if no raptor were present, they would form a living river in the air and replicate the angles, curves, and undulations of the attacked flock before them. A single memory bonded millions of pigeons together." Unquote. <coughs> I'll come back later briefly to the theoretical register of this swarm-like behavior, but it should be noted that, practically speaking, this strategy of what's called predator satiation is precisely what enabled the passenger pigeon's rapid, rapid demise once all the necessary technological ingredients were in place. In his ornithological biography, Audubon recounts the various strategies employed to produce the mass carnage that led to the passenger pigeon's extinction. <coughs> various sorts of firearms were used, of course, but also large pole and net contraptions that would garner thousands of birds at one time. Sulfur pots generated fumes that would asphyxiate birds by the thousands. <coughs> Uh, trees were felled as tens of thousands of nests and nestlings fell to the ground, and birds were poisoned with whiskey-soaked corn so that they could be rounded up easily, just to name a few, a few of the more tried and true strategies. Some Native Americans who had partaken of pigeon, pigeon flesh as part of their subsistence for years found these methods disturbing, to say the least. Potawatomi leader Pokagan, disgusted by one 1880 massacre he had witnessed, wondered about what sort of punishment in the afterlife would be, quote, awaiting our white neighbors who have so wantonly butchered and driven from our forests these wild pigeons, the most beautiful flowers of the animal creation of North America, unquote. Both of these, <coughs> the scene of slaughter and the moral indignation, are depicted in a famous scene in James Fenimore Cooper's The Pioneers, published in 1823, a novel that is a call to judgment, as Jerome McGann has recently argued, about the treatment of other species, other native peoples, as he's put it, that's recorded in Cooper's work. As the massive flocks of passenger pigeons descend upon the town of Templeton in the novel, the people of the village are whipped into a frenzy, and along with the poles and nets, every species of firearm, quote unquote, is deployed. But most significant of these is an old small swivel cannon once used in the inroads into the Indian settlements, as Cooper writes, later deployed for patriotic ceremonies such as Fourth of July celebrations, but now filled with duck shot and fired into the passing columns of pigeons. <coughs> as Leatherstocking observes the scene, he is, quote, able to keep his sentiments to himself until, until he saw the introduction of the swivel cannon into the sports. But then he objects, quote, it's wicked to be shooting into flocks in this wasty manner to kill 20 and eat one. When I want such a thing, I go into the woods till I find one to my liking, and then I shoot him off the branches without touching a feather of another, even though there might be a hundred on the same tree, unquote. In the meantime, he says, taking his leave, quote, I wouldn't touch one of the harmless things that here cover the ground, looking up with their eyes on me, as if they only wanted tongues to say their thoughts." Unquote. Now, <clears throat> much could be said, of course, about all the various ethical and political dimensions of this scene, not least of all the use of the patriotic cannon to clear both Indians and pigeons, but one of the things that Leatherstocking's response draws our attention to is the difference between multiplicity and singularity that, flame, that frames the entire story of the passenger pigeon. And more importantly, the contrasting ways of relating to that difference bodied forth in the use of the patriotic cannon against flocks, or so-called primitive hordes, so numerous that they are more like a swarm of insects, versus Leatherstocking's thoughts of having his gaze returned by one of the individual creatures looking up with their eyes on me. Now this image, <coughs> this image of the birds as a kind of superorganism or swarm uh, is an easy mark, I take it, for any armchair Delizian, and certainly for Yusuf Parika, whose book Insect Media was published in the post humanities series. But I want to return now to the installation, and specifically to Martha, and ask what resides at the other pole of this configuration, <coughs> the pole of singularity. What is Martha exactly? A pet? A fetish? A curiosity? A relic? We might say that her captivity, display, and the giving to her of a proper name all, all attempt to turn her into these things. But these compensatory gestures only underscore all the more that this is the case, too, of fetishistic disavowal. 
not so much of our grotesque role in the extinction of our species, but perhaps of our own finitude in relation to other forms of life, which calls forth these compensatory attempts to curate, curate you might say, the boundaries between life and death, survival and extinction, all of which is indexed, it seems to me, by the strange fact of giving an exact date to the extinction of her species. But in a much more real sense, <coughs> the passenger pigeon, considered as a complex of system environment interactions that evolve over time versus what we might call the simplex of the brute material persistence of her body and her DNA, were already extinct before Martha died. And our exertion of curatorial power over the life-death boundary on the site of extinction, even to the point of dating it by our calendar and our archive, is driven by the same thing that drives Martha's name. Martha, who in fact was named for George Washington's young widow, <coughs> and her mate George, who died a year earlier, named for the president himself, the epitome of sovereignty for the young nation, if ever there was one. But the whole point, of course, is that the passenger pigeon is neither beast nor sovereign. And all of this, in my view, is outed, as it were, by Martha's Peel in the exhibition, where we're invited to sit and spin around inside the cage, <coughs> vocalize or play an instrument in memory of Martha's bird song, and draw on the chalkboard floor as Martha would have rubbed her beak on a chalk block inside the cage, while as we spin photographic stills from Edward Mybridge's famous series of the passenger pigeon whiz by, <laughs> perhaps quickly enough to show the bird in flight, creating a kind of spectral reanimation. Is this a process of becoming bird, as the title of the live video projection of the inside of Martha Peel suggests? No, nothing could be farther from the truth, I think, because the point is that the birds are already gone, already part of a historical record archived by Mybridge's photographs. We are, to be sure, invited to occupy Martha's space, perhaps to identify with her singularity and isolation by having our attention focused on our own. We are, in short, invited to open the question of the relationship between her finitude, her death, and our own. But in the end, I think, we're back to the question of dwelling, <coughs> which we've discussed a lot here in the conference, to what constitutes a proper or appropriate form of dwelling and for whom, with whom. Back, in fact, to Leatherstocking's protestation, put an end, judge, to all your clearing, unquote. We're back, that is to say, to dwelling, and specifically its relation to the eco of ecology via the oikos that links it to the eco of economy. The, oiko, the oikos that marks off and delineates <coughs> a home inside from outside as a place where the relation between organism and environment is stabilized, secured, even made calculable and economizable. If the eco of ecology is faithfully linked, as Michael Martyr puts it, to quote, the oikos belonging to the family and standing for property, the proper domus, one's own domain, unquote, then the challenge here is how to think in an aneconomic an an sense of a proper or appropriate dwelling, one divorced from property, the family, the proper name, such as Martha, and finally from sovereignty itself. Part of the conceptual and emotional torque of the piece, in other words, is the irony of Martha's final dwelling, which testifies all the more to the necessity of thinking dwelling otherwise, perhaps as a migratory process, not a process of clearing, as precisely passengers, as we who are passing through. This complex nexus of temporality, dwelling, <coughs> iterability, and materialization is put very much on the front burner by other elements in the installation. In the component Eight Voices Before Columbus, which references the names for the passenger pigeon used by the Lenape, Ojibwe, Kaskaskia, Mohawk, Choctaw, Seneca, and Narragansett Indians, where viewers are invited to drop an acorn, a key food source for the pigeon, into the podium after reciting the name of an extinct bird species, <coughs> which takes us back, of course, to our discussion of Cooper's The Pioneers. And most of all, in the component called Unveiling, the glass wall entrance to the gallery on which are printed letters that turn out to be fragments of the mitochondrial genome sequence of the passenger pigeon <coughs> supplied by Ben Novak, who is working with the Long Now Foundation, 
started by none other than Stuart Brand of the Coevolution Quarterly and Whole, Whole Earth Catalog, and its revive and restore program to bring back the passenger pigeon as part of a larger de-extinction project. And I noticed happily, happily, happily that there's a whole panel on de-extinction this afternoon, including a paper on the passenger pigeon, so you know where I'll be after this uh, <laughs> session. <coughs> the complexities of the de-extinction process, let alone the debates about its viability and ethics, are far too detailed to go into here. You have to go to the next panel for that one. But even as proponents realize, in contrast to magically going backwards in time via genetics, a time loop that's related in an interesting way to the palindrome of Peel's foe and the train going back and forth underneath it, that there are other slower and more multidimensional temporalities at work here in the environmental factors affecting morphology and development, in the process of, of imprinting social learning and communication, and much else besides that's going to make this whole thing work or not work. In other words, <coughs> as Christopher Johnson puts it, quote, code is both regulating before, but also regulated after, in the sense that the program is executed in a context that's perpetually changing. And this means that DNA is a relational determined part of a whole developmental system, unquote, as so much recent work in epigenetics has, em has emphasized. The danger inherent in this new script of life around de-extinction and the fetishization of, of genetics, as Julian Murfitch uh, terms it in relation to de-extinction efforts with not the pigeon but the woolly mammoth, is that, quote, it has nothing to do with the molar form or representational shape of the creature and everything to do with parcelized units of production on the one hand and strings of mappable code on the other. Two correlated models of futurity, he continues, are implicit in this new script. The implicit eternity of the market and the promise of species revival whose innermost impulse is simply the infinite manipulability of life itself, unquote. That is to say, <coughs> in the terms we used earlier, curatorial control over what Derrida calls the life-death relation. This question is certainly in play in Pestle's wall of genetic code, and there's also much to be said about glass and windows, both the architectural innovation and the operating system for computers, in relation to, to processes of visualization and capture that I can't go into here. <coughs> but I'd like to see, in Pestle's unveiling, an agnostic, if not indeed cautionary, note in this regard, one that reaches back, and I can't make the argument here for lack of time, to Marcel Duchamp's concept of delay at work in his famous piece, The Large Glass, The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelors, which is alluded to in Mel Chen's early piece, Bird in a Cage, which is in fact <coughs> a portrait on glass of Martha that explicitly references Duchamp's concept of delay, with Martha, of course, in the position of the bride. Think back now to Martha and George. Pestle's glass, in other words, <coughs> holds out to us the prospect that the passenger pigeon may yet live again, that we can somehow undo what we've done, and yet cautions us not to look at the species, or Martha, through a shop window that too readily links genetic code, market, time, and what we call life. And in its foregrounding <coughs> of time-based performance and musical improvisation, the installation is itself, in fact, neither a code nor a script, but, as Derrida might say, a space in which what those scripts can produce is as promising and as unpredictable, for better or for worse, as life and death itself. Thank you. Uh, 
Mark and Brenda's piece, uh, which, I, which I hadn't seen before, the, the images, and it, it looks like a great show. And, um, uh, so I guess the question that I have is whether the, uh, thinking about what you were saying about Martha, whether the condor is extinct. Is extinct? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, clearly the last one's yeah. still flying, but is it extinct? I mean, that's, that's not a rhetorical question. I mean, I, my, my, my answer would be that, and actually Ron would, would have a better answer to this because he's been more on the ground with what's going on with the, uh, with the conservation efforts. But um, I, I would say not in the sense of the system environment relationship being able to sustain itself in a, in a way that characterizes the species over, over long periods of time, you know, hundreds and thousands of years. That seems to be still going on with the condor, um, even though it's going on in the face of this whole, um, you know, kind of catastrophe in a way with lead bullets. And, and each, though, even though each one has a number under its wing, and there's five million dollars a year that's spent to keep them flying. Well, you know, this this interesting. This came up in in, uh, in the previous panel that I attended. And I would say, yeah, because I don't, I don't think there, I don't think there's ever any pure non-technologized animal uh, uh, of any kind. Um, whether you want to talk about that in terms of how we relate to it, how we, how we cognize it with our own, what Gregory Bateson calls our own maps. You know, when he says the map is not the territory. So I find that um, these strategies of, of, of management and surveillance and support and so on, um, an intensification of a technologization of human-animal relations that's, and not just human-animal relations, but human-human relations that's already there. Um, so I don't really see it as a difference in kind, but, but to go back to, uh, I guess, Shane's paper in the previous panel, um, it is a different, in, it's a difference in speeds, and it's a difference in, in intensifications of things that were already there that actually vastly complicate the question of what we mean by wild and wildlife. Um, so, you know, as, as I've talked about before, I think, Nigel, you were at this conference at the State where I was on a panel with Greg Mittman, who's done a lot of work with elephants. And, you know, arguably, elephants are so surveilled and so monitored now and so enmeshed in a technological grid of, of quote-unquote management that, you know, probably the squirrels that live in your backyard are, are wilder in terms of wildlife <laughs> than these, these iconic, you know, charismatic megafauna creatures, you know. So it vastly complicates what we mean when we talk about what the wild or wildlife, for sure. Thank you. Kung Kung? Yeah. I was very struck, actually, by a kind of strange parallel between your talk and Claire Colebrook's talk yesterday. I mean, um, the last full-blood Tasmanian Aborigine, right. the last passenger pigeon, Martha, you know, with the dated obituary, I think. And I'm just thinking um, that what is the nature and the weight of responsibility where human and non-human extinctions come into play. Because I'm wondering if, if, you know, how would one actually make, you know, distinctions um, without reintroducing some form of the human again. <coughs> right. In ways which were not necessarily on parity with the non-human. Uh, and, and, and you know this idea of the biography of the you know call it biography or obituary. I think they're both. You know, in the case of the Tasmanian the Tasmanian Tiger, yeah, just kind of like an official biography. Right, right. Whereas here we have um, an aesthetic installation, which is you know, obviously trying to open up a variety of perspectives at the same time. So I'm, I'm actually then thinking that what if we were to place you know here as an interrogative term, the culling of, say, battery hens or chickens, you know, who have avian flu. These are supervised mass market extinctions, right? And, um, you know, just as 
gruesome and grotesque as the disappearance of the passenger pigeon. Right. So, uh, and, and there, you know, the weight seems to fall on being saved, being rescued right. from a fate worse than avian flu or something like that. Right. So I'm, 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 I'm just sort of putting this as a question because I'm wondering, you know, um, that within the non-human itself, <coughs> There is such a carving out of territory which separates the, you know, the, the, the heroinization of the passenger system right. versus the anonymity of the millions of chickens and hens which are culled every year in some part of the world or the other. Oh yeah. Well, you know, this is this is what before the law is about, actually. Uh, and and I mean the way the way that the, to make the, to make the argument of that book really short. I mean, where I come down on that question, uh, and I think what I share with, with um, one of the things my talk shares with where Claire's coming from, is that, and this is part of my emphasis here, is that whatever these instances are, they are radically non-generic instances. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the, the example you just raised about passenger pigeon versus food animals, whatever's going on there is not about the distinction human animal. It's actually a biopolitical apparatus that is at work that, for which human and animal are not constitutive terms. And so one example I've given in Before the Law is that you know the pet industry in North America is a huge, massive, booming industry. So you have, you have non-human creatures in North America who have access to a higher quality of life in all kinds of identifiable ways, including health insurance. <laughs> that a vast number of the world's human population does not have access to. That's not in spite of the fact that your golden retriever is an animal, it's because your golden retriever is an animal. And yet, these food animals are being killed, being treated in exactly the opposite way, because they're animals. And so whatever's going on, you can't parse in terms of the human-animal distinction. Right? Something else is happening, and I think it's actually my argument before the law is it's deeply woven into the biopolitical fabric of contemporary life for which these kinds of distinctions won't help us make any, you know, make any sense, right? Um, now having said that, I think what we're back to finally um, <coughs> is putting our cards on the table about who and what we don't care about. Uh, and I don't think that's an avoidable thing. And this is why any discourse of life, capital L, having any valence whatsoever ethically to me is of no use and, and pernicious, in fact, in many different instances. And so, <clears throat> so I think what we have to do is, is be um, clear and committed and specific about what we do and don't care about. And then, of course, the next problem to rear its ugly head, as Claire's paper made very clear, is the problem of ethnocentrism. So, so, and once the problem of ethnocentrism comes back to make you worry about what you do and don't care about, then you actually have to return to phenomenological and ontological questions and say, well, there's got to be some way that, 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 that doesn't step outside or purify um, my situatedness, to use Donna Haraway's term, but that doesn't reduce all the ethical and political choices and their rightness or wrongness to, to, to my particular situatedness, anthropologically, historically, sociologically, and so on. And that's where the phenomenological and ontological questions, you know, come back in, I think, and, and have to be and have to be dealt with. So so if you bring those back in, one thing that's clear <coughs> is that the pig who is subjected to what's called a rape rack in factory farming. And is, and is subjected to the most horrendous kind of treatment from the day it's born until the day it's killed in factory farming, is phenomenologically and ontologically actually not very different from your golden retriever who has health insurance. You know, the animals may be different, they're not that different, right? And so that's where I think you have to bring back <coughs> the ontological and phenomenological questions and make them rub up against these questions of of your own anthropological practices of whoever, of whoever the we is that you're talking about. That, no, I think it's a really, that's a great question, a very complicated question, and I think for those reasons, an unavoidably biopolitical question.
Yeah, so uh, I've got a question, but a quick comment. Uh, Green Acres reminds us of the affinities <laughs> between uh, pigs and golden retrievers. <laughs> so just to underscore that point, uh, Arnold was... Uh, we had an Arnold Ziffel reference. <laughs> <laughs> Arnold had no health insurance, but he was well treated. First, first conference this year, I've had an Arnold Ziffel. Well treated. I want to come back to Nigel's question. Uh, yeah. Because I was, you know, when you first started talking about the condors, it brought back to me a morning when my son and I were in the Grand Canyon. We went out very early along the South Rim and encountered one of these uh, park biology ranger guys with a radio, right. you know, with his radio uh, receiver who was tracking the condors. And because, right. as Nigel said, they're, you know, they're they're all they all have numbers and so on right. and so forth. Right. And we had this combination of. Uh, kind of ecological management and phenomenological encounter with this, these right. others that was fantastic. Right. You know, and so I just kind of, I still remember that, that moment and will for a really long time. Um, but, and I'm forgetting all sorts of things these days. Uh, but the question of those condors and their management, I wouldn't answer Nigel's question, I think, in, finally in the way you did, which is, no, they're not extinct, or at least I wouldn't simply and I know you didn't simply answer that, but actually I would put there this whole process of condor management and the question of the extinction or non-extinction of a species in more direct contact with both that exhibit, which had the 20 <laughs> photographs of, the, of these dead condors, but also with the archiving them, the frozen bodies and their marking yeah. Yeah. there, because these are part and parcel yes. of simultaneously the same either extinction or management or wildness of, right. of the condor. And so yeah. I think that that's where I, think, where I would go if I was going yeah. to begin to answer that question. Yeah. And so, you know, as you think about this paper a little further, you know, I think it would be interesting to talk, to bring in not just the condors in the exhibit, but actually to bring in a little bit about the what's happening in condor management and how that management and the management of the dead condor carcasses and in triangulation then with the art exhibit becomes I think a really kind of complex uh, oh, yeah. complex relationship oh, yeah. And, yeah. and one that just to forecast the um, the wrap up session because I, I don't want to go there now I'm really interested in us thinking a bit later about why art seems to be such a privileged medium right now for representing extinction or the Anthropocene so that's not something I, that's just a to plant in people's yeah, I, heads for us to talk about at the end. Yeah, I do want to. I do want to talk about that last question in the in the round table because it's come up in a lot of the papers. Um, I'm interested to hear what other folks have to say. But what what you're driving at is exactly what I was getting at in the last section of the paper about the archive. You know, and that there there, there are no ar there are no archives without state power. Right. And in this case, I would say an identifiably biopolitical form of state power that's based not on racial distinctions, but species distinctions, um, and valuations of certain creatures and not others. Um, even as, paradoxically, what's being archived, it, as Derrida puts it, is this thing that happens there. The whole reason it's being archived mm -hmm. is it's something that comes from this realm of art, this other form of life. And so one thing I couldn't get into in the paper because I had to shorten it, but it's in the longer version, is about actually the transcripts which, which Mark uh, Wilson sent me uh, that, that appear below the condor photographs. You couldn't really see them very well. And they're very in lengths of conversations with the scientists. And some of these texts are really, really moving. And they're not moving because the scientists are trying to be moving. But what's interesting is what bubbles up through the official story of, well, I'm a scientist, and I can collect data on body weight and reproductive rates and all this. But what bubbles up uh, in the text with the scientists is, is, a, is a kind of a, sometimes it's an anger, sometimes it's a frustration, and sometimes it's a, it's a, kind, of, it's a kind of love of having your life, your day-to-day -day life completely entwined with a particular bird over a long period of time. And so one of, one of the things I had to cut was one of these texts where the scientist says, oh, bird number, bird number 133 and I had the same birthday. 
<laughs> it's the little things that make you connect. And so one of the interesting things about the, about the exhibition and about the archive is it shows how these, these attempts to use you know, state power to purify and drive hard and fast boundaries between, let's say, trash animals, which these you know, conduits.